G'day, welcome back to the Soil Organic Carbon course. My name is Till Simmons from Agrisol. Today we'll be talking about the decomposition pathway, which is one of the pathways we can build soil organic carbon. Um, if this is the first uh, video in um, the course that you're watching, go and check out the previous videos. We have an uh, intro to uh, soil organic carbon and matter, which is the first one, the benefits. Um, we also have the like an overview to the pathways. Uh, and then we have this one, and then the future uh, we'll be talking about the other pathway as well. But in this video, we'll be talking about the overview of the decomposition pathway, how it works, as well as how we can increase this cycle or this process to make sure we can maximize um, this process and build soil organic carbon faster. Awesome. Well, if you like this, make sure to subscribe. Uh, go check out um, the course on our uh, website because we have a bunch of supplementary material on that. It's all for free. There's no email opt-in or anything. Uh, it's just Free information so take or leave it up to you so the decomposition pathway is all about breaking down organic matter so we have our organic matter here this can be anything from plant material manure biochar compost animal residue manure anything that's really uh, organic material that breaks down into smaller smaller pieces um, those smaller pieces are called labile carbon which are active um, bits of carbon in our soil Go watch the first video if you want to learn more about labile carbon and the other components of soil organic matter. So that whole process is done by microbes. So bacteria, fungi, um, so they break down and decompose this labile carbon. In particular, bacteria kind of consume easy to eat um, compounds, so like simple sugars, things with a low carbon nitrogen ratio, meaning that there's a high amount of nitrogen in there. Fungi tend to decompose um, Hard to break down things, things with higher um, uh, resistance to decomposition, things like cellulose, things with a really high carbon nitrogen ratio. Now, protozoa and nematodes, these are more uh, consumers. They consume on our bacteria and fungi, as well as each other. They keep this cycle moving within this. So we have labile carbon, which comes from our organic matter. So if you grow a cover crop, for example, and terminate it, which is what we have here, we grow a cover crop, we have the roots growing, we have the um, above ground biomass of the leaves, the stem, whatever. We come along, crimp it down or terminate it. That is going to be organic matter. If we have livestock come in, they're gonna eat it. We still have the roots, we're gonna get manure. All that's going to cycle through the soil, which is our labile carbon. Now the labile carbon itself is technically soil organic matter. So, we can, so that in itself is soil organic carbon. Well, that's not the soil organic carbon we want. We want it as uh, resistant organic matter. Resistant organic matter actually stays in the soil. Uh, so this whole process is getting to resistant soil organic carbon. So labile carbon, or, so organic matter breaks into labile carbon, which is going to be all these compounds here. So we have our proteins, we have our lipids and carbohydrates. So they kind of make up the macro compounds um, in biological systems. Those things are eaten by our microbes. The microbes eat each other and eventually spit out a simpler and simpler um, compounds. In that process, some of the carbon is used by our microbes in respiration, which means they release that as carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere onto the soil. Um, so we lose that carbon out of the system. Now this system is very inefficient. It only converts about 3.8% of the carbon at the start. So all this, only 3.8% of that actually gets moved into resistant organic matter. Very inefficient. Most of it moves out as carbon dioxide or stays in the system as labile carbon, just cycling. But eventually it'll cycle out. Now in, in the study that um, I got that number, the results range from about 3% to about 17%. So there's there's a, uh, a range there. But the average was 3.8%. Now you might be thinking, well, if it's super inefficient, what's the point? Like, is there any benefits to this? And there is. So there's a number of benefits that we get from the decomposition pathway. And the first one is that it cycles nutrients. So if you think of a cover crop or a green manure crop, say these are all legumes, they're fixing nitrogen. When this is terminated, it's going to release those nutrients for the other crop. So then we say we plant another crop in, those nutrients will then be available to the next crop. It's not just nitrogen, it's everything. It's you know potassium, phosphorus, sulfur, all our trace minerals, everything. Everything that this plant absorbs, it's going to, it's going to store in organic um, material, decompose, release those materials back into the soil for the next crop. So fantastic for a fertilizer or a natural fertilizer effect. 
The other really beneficial thing that we get from this cycle is that it stimulates our microbes. Now specifically, it stimulates our decomposing um, fungi and bacteria, as well as the predatory um, protozoa and nematodes. This can be really important if we're trying to reduce disease in our bacteria and fungi, as by stimulating the nematodes, they're going to be um, they're going to then prey on the uh, pathogens. The other beneficial thing that we get is we do get a little bit of um, resistance to organic matter, so it's not all lost. Um, it, I'm sure if we add biochar, that, that has a high conversion rate. And when we have um, organic matter with higher carbon to nitrogen ratios, we probably get a higher conversion rate. And finally, a effect that we probably don't think about is actually a fertilizing effect from carbon dioxide. So this allows our soil to breathe. It allows our soil to release carbon dioxide to then supply our plants with carbon dioxide so that they can use it in photosynthesis. So that can be quite beneficial, especially when we're trying to increase our um, photosynthesis. So what can we do to maximize this process? And what I mean by this is we want to, uh, if we want to produce a large amount of um, soil organic carbon, stable soil organic carbon, with this process, as well as claim all the other benefits of um, stimulating microbes and um, cycling nutrients, how can we do that um, using this pathway? And there's really two, two stages of this pathway. There's the growing stage or the growth stage, and then there's the decay stage. And we'll go on to each of those, and what we can do at each of these stages to maximize the decomposition pathway. So the first aim of the growth stage is to, we want to maximize the amount of biomass we've produced. So it, now it's also important to think about this over a time period. Um, so the total amount of biomass you can produce in a year, that's going to contribute to our um, total biomass that we can, we can put into the cycle. Because remember, our CCE is basically fixed at 8.3%. Uh, we can't really change that for this process. Maybe, maybe we can, we'll talk about that, but let's assume that's fixed. The only thing that we can uh, change about that is the rate of decomposition, which is our decay stage, and the amount that we're feeding it, which is our growing stage. So we want to maximize biomass production. How can we do that? Firstly, the species that we're using. So we want to probably use C4s, um, so more tropical species. Um, they can produce a lot more biomass than our say threes, but generally species of plants in our either cover crops or our green manure crops or even that we're growing, plants that produce a lot of biomass. That's that's the that, that's the first key. We want to also maximise um, biodiversity. There's a few studies that show that there's a positive correlation between diversity, plant uh, species diversity, and biomass production. Now this is mainly because it fills niches within the ecosystem. So say for example, you have grass and a legume, the legume's gonna have a taproot, it's gonna go deeper into the soil and get different uh, nutrients and, and um, a different level of, of water. Um, and some legumes climb, so let's say this climbs up the grass. And so we can maximize the uh, amount of um, root and canopy architecture to maximize biodiversity. There's also sharing nutrients and, and whatnot, but generally, more diversity, the more biomass produced. So when we're thinking about our cover crops, we wanna make sure we have a really diverse cover crop that's gonna make sure we uh, increase the amount of biomass produced. We're gonna to wanna to increase our planting density, and, and if possible, we wanna do that. Um, vegetative growth uh, maxes out at a certain point, so uh, making sure that we really get up to that point where it max, uh, that we get the, the most biomass production um, is ideal. Fourth, we want to maximize photosynthesis. This is quite interesting. Um, we can increase the photosynthesis that a plant has. And we're going to do this nutritionally. So we want to make sure our plants have sufficient amounts of nitrogen, phosphorus, magnesium, sulfur, iron, and manganese. All of those have a role in photosynthesis. And when we have all of these, plant, uh, all of these, some estimate that we can increase photosynthesis of a plant by four times, which means it's the same number of plants, but we get four times as much photosynthesis, which means we're gonna get not quite four times as much biomass, but we're definitely gonna get more biomass and more root extract, which is important for the next uh, topic in the course. But this is quite important. 
And lastly, we want to make sure that we, we, we terminate our crops, or we terminate our cover crops or the green manure crop or whatever we're growing at the right stage, depending on our goals. So typically a high carbon to nitrogen ratio will result in a slow decay, favoring uh, fungal decomposition, whereas a low carbon nitrogen ratio, meaning there's more nitrogen, results in a fast decay, fa favoring bacterial decomposition. This is typical of younger plants, our um, uh, lower carbon nitrogen ratio, a higher carbon to nitrogen ratio is more typical of older plants. So once the plant goes into a reproductive mode, um, fast decay is typical of legumes because they have a higher nitrogen component compared to grasses. Now, if we want to maintain ground cover, increase ground cover for longer, we want to make sure we have a high carbon to uh, nitrogen ratio. But if we want to increase cycling, we probably want to fast decay, so high nitrogen. Keep that in mind if you're kind of using this for cover crops and the way you want the cover crop to perform after it's been terminated. So what do we have here? We have, say, a lot of plants that are suited to producing a lot of biomass. We also have diversity, so it's going to be filling up these spaces. All these plants, are we gonna, we're going to have lots of plants per um, per metre or per, uh, per certain area. All these plants are going to be really you know, increasing their photosynthetic rate because we've given them a Kickstarter fertiliser made with these or we've given them a, a bit of nutrition on the seed coat. That's a really good and effective way of this. Otherwise, the starter fertiliser with a cover crop go a long way and we don't lose those nutrients as we're going to cycle it all back for the next crop. Um, and then depending on our goals, we're going to either let this grow out a bit further into um, the more the reproductive stage and then terminate, um, or we're going to terminate it earlier, have more legumes, just depending on our goals. Now the final thing I haven't written down here, but it's important to note, is making sure that we're using up our fallow periods to grow plants if we can, given our water restrictions. Um, if you think about a typical wheat crop, you're only really growing a, a crop for, say, five months of the year. It's only really photosynthesizing and producing biomass for five months. The rest of the time, it's fallow. If you want to produce the most amount of biomass, we also need to be thinking about those fallow periods and producing biomass all throughout the year. We can produce a massive amount of biomass just in a few months, but if the rest of the year is fallow, it doesn't really matter um, compared to producing biomass all year round. So that, that's an important thing to know. So moving on to our decay stage. This is really just a function of uh, a rapid cycling of our biomass. So that's going to be done by our microbes. So the whole point of this is increasing microbial activity and populations. The first thing we want to make sure we do is limit our chemical use. Nitrogen fertilizers and salt-based uh, fertilizers um, can be really harsh on our microbes. Um, so we want to try and limit that. And it, I know it's easier to say uh, than to actually do. Um, but generally, if we can cut out some of our fertilizers or build systems that we don't need them, the better. Um, it kind of goes without saying, but fungicides kill fungi. Fungi are needed in cycling and nutrients. But also, if you have a fungal infection of, a, of your crop, you don't really want to lose your whole crop. So everything, in, everything is in moderation. We've just got to think through that. We want to go to no-till. Uh, most Australian farmers no-till. Um, if you're an American listening to this, definitely consider no-till. Um, it will improve your soil and your, and your yields. Um, but when we do plough up our paddocks, there is, um, it, we disturb our soil microbes. Uh, we also really break up our fungal hyphae um, so that we're going to be damaging our, our uh, microbial populations. It's not good. We also want to make sure our soil is covered all the time. This prevents fluctuations in our soil temperature, making it a nice environment for our microbes. Also, it protects our microbes from um, UV light. We want to make sure we have diversity. Diversity stimulates microbial diversity. There's a number of research articles about that. Um, the more diversity we have, the more active and diverse our soil microbes are. And finally, we can uh, apply inoculants and biostimulants to the seeds um, as a seed coat, that's the most efficient and cost-effective way of doing it. Uh, otherwise, we can apply it 
uh, to the soil or as a foliar onto the plants. That way, we're going to increase our total amount of microbes as well as the activity of those microbes to cycle through the organic matter that we just produced even faster, which means we can increase the, um, the rate of... Um, that means we can increase the rate of conversion, increase the cycling, and get a uh, more functioning system. Cool, so that's it for the decomposition pathway. Next, we'll be talking about the liquid carbon pathway, which is so much more efficient. Uh, if you like this video, make sure to subscribe uh, and go check out the course on our, our website. There's a whole bunch of more um, material and um, you know, additional resources that you can access, all for free. There's no email opt-in, um, so it's not, not like a marketing stunt or anything. It's just free information you go use. Otherwise, thanks for watching.